moving forward. So today we have Kara Franco. Woo! Yay. Uh, Kara is a copywriter and digital marketer, and she is a fellow WordPresser. Um, we met her from the uh, from the Orlando Word WordPress group. Um, so she's she's with that group, um, but she's also joined our group. So we're happy to have her and to have her present for us today. Um, I wanted to introduce her more. I don't know as much about her background as I as I had hoped to at this point. I we didn't connect as soon as I should have. I got behind. That's my fault. But uh, I've looked at some of her work. It's excellent. Her, her writing is very concise, short sentences. I have a hard time with short sentences. Let me tell you, I, I go on forever. So she's, she's very good at what she does. So I'm going to turn the time over to her really quick. So if, if you're ready, we'll get you hooked up to um, the screen here. Today's presentation is how to develop a brand voice in your copywriting. All right. Um, well. Hello everyone, thank you so much for having me as part of your WordPress group. Um, I am a digital marketer and copywriter, as Rob mentioned. I really focus in on copywriting and content. Um, the way I usually introduce myself is I create and manage websites for small business owners. I help them communicate with their customers and grow their businesses. My specialty is um, creating short, concise copy. Um, I really clean up and clarify your messaging so that your customers get it. Now that's my brand, right? I like to keep things short and to the point. That may not be your brand. So today we're gonna to be talking about how to develop a brand voice in your copywriting. Your brand voice might not sound like mine, but that's the point, right? So um, why? Why should you even care about this? Well, um, for one, if you have a strong brand voice in your copy, your copy will be more persuasive. It'll also be more memorable. Um, the other thing that's great about having a brand voice in your copy is that it's going to help you attract your ideal audience. Is everyone familiar with an ideal audience? Yeah, pretty yeah. much. Okay, good. The how. Um, so today we're gonna be reviewing what a brand is, briefly. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about your ideal audience, and then we'll go over some communication cues the power of tone and point of view in your writing, and also word choice. And then I'll share with you a really easy, simple resource that you can use to develop this brand voice in your own copy. There's also a bonus. <laughs> the bonus is, well, we're all here because of WordPress, right? So there's going to be a little bit of a tie-in at the end to how you can use a WordPress tool to help you with this brand voice in your copy. Um, and balance that with clarity in your messaging. So we'll start with what is a brand. Does anyone have an idea of what a brand is? You can just shout it out if you want. Great, yeah, okay, I love that. Anyone else? It's your reputation. Yes. It's the image you want to portray, what people think of you. So uh, when most people think about a brand, they think about what a brand looks like. They think about colors and fonts and logos. Uh, it's not often that we think about what a brand sounds like. But when you hear a strong brand voice, you know it immediately. You recognize it. So um, Merriam-Webster has a, a <laughs> an interesting definition of brand. It um, sort of encompasses everything that we've talked about but it's a little stale for my taste. Of your copywriting, what I'm really getting to is that distinct tone and point of view and word choice that I talked about earlier. And word choice doesn't have to be individual words. It can also be phrases. It can be references. Um, so your ideal audience. For any piece of communication to be effective, whether it's spoken or written, you have to know who you're speaking to. Um, that way you can tailor your message to them. The way that you would say something to a third grader is not the same way you would say it to a 35-year-old. Um, similarly, if I'm talking to plumbers and tradesmen, it's not going to be the same way I'm talking to an executive of a business. When you know who your audience is, you can tailor your message to them. You can use their language. You can use uh, references that they're familiar with. And there are a few other cues. 
So uh, when we think about communication cues, we tend to think about verbal cues, whether those are direct, asking a question, giving an instruction, or indirect. Um, it usually also has to do with prompts and questions, but a little less direct. We also think about verbal cues. Um, so for example, I'm standing up here and I'm nervous, I'm shifting my feet, I might be hunched over a little bit, uh, but if I'm confident, I have my shoulders back, I'm standing strong and proud, you can, I'm conveying that non-verbally, right? Um, so there are similar cues in written communication. Uh, it has to do with formality, so the use of contractions um, or jargon, industry language. And um, we're going to go over some of those now. So um, we talk a lot about the power that written language has in forming relationships with customers um, in the branding world. And there's not a whole lot of studies out there that reinforce this, but I was able to find one study that's pretty interesting if you want to look it up. It was done by a team in Australia, and the result of that study found that, in fact, there are elements of written messages that can build and strengthen relationships with your customers and your audience. I'm blowing through this pretty fast, so if anyone wants me to slow down, just let me know. Uh, the first thing is tone. So tone is the attitude that you have in your writing. It can be formal, it can be informal. Um, you can also think of it as your role in relation to the person that you're writing for. So are you a friend? Are you a teacher? Are you a mentor? Are you some neutral party? All of that comes into play when you're developing your writing. style or manner of expression in speaking or writing. Can anyone tell me uh, what tone they use in their writing for their own brand? I kind of just no speak. one? But go ahead. Just my own natural style. Of Your natural style of speaking, right? Yeah, yeah so when yeah. I was young, um, I remember sitting down at the typewriter for the first time, and I was probably six or seven years old, she said, okay, who do you write, want to write to? I said, I want to write to my aunt. Okay, we'll go ahead. So I sat there. I said, well, I don't know how. How do I write a letter? She said, well, just imagine that you're on the phone with her and you're having a conversation. And I swear that was the best piece of advice that my mother has ever given me. Um, it's the way that I approach all of my writing now. I think about how would I say this to the person if I was standing in front of them, right? And so when you're trying to come up with the tone of voice that you want to use in your writing, Think about how you would say it to a person in person. We tend to go a little overly formal when we write. Um, some of that might be overcompensating. We feel like we have to prove ourselves in some way, especially when we're writing uh, content for our websites, um, really putting ourselves out there. Uh, but a lot of times, more of an informal tone can build a stronger connection with the person that you're writing to, to that, ide that ideal audience. A question, isn't there kind of a spectrum in that, and I just use one, one example, so I've got a, uh, one of my clients is a, is a men's shop, they sell suits and jackets and stuff. Yes. And they have <coughs> the black with red roses, formal jackets that you would see an MC or a page doing, and they also have conservative, solid, black, dark suits. Mm -hmm. Their audience is all over the place, mm -hmm. and they have kind of a heavy urban market certain styles and could be a banker or a, a lawyer in other styles and so I have to be careful I can't when I'm writing copy for the website I can't be you know get down funky and pull that off um, or too conservative on the other end but I've got a website that has all that together now, if I was doing an email focus focus that but what, how do you approach that when you've got a really a broad spectrum of an audience and a tone? Is it just kind of like the lowest common denominator? Yes. Um, so when I'm working with a brand and they have a variety of audiences that they're speaking to, I try to look for what's the common thread, right, that runs through all of these, these audiences. Why are they here? Why are they coming to this person or this company for that service or product? Um, it might be quality. It might be low prices. It might be that we have any, any style that you can imagine in stock. Right? Um, when, you're, when you're thinking about the tone in your copy, you don't want to 
be switching around all of the time because then your customers don't have a clear idea of who it is that you are, right? So if I show up like this for you, later, you know, hanging out, talking, using slang and someone, with someone else, you're going to have a confused idea of who it is I am and the image that I'm trying to project. So it can be really difficult to find that common thread, but it's so worthwhile because once you lock into that, you can keep it consistent and then people start to recognize you for that brand, for that tone. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. If you want to talk to me afterwards with some specific People want to look nice and uh -huh. their style, and they, you know, they may go into a club and want a certain style, and they may be going into a bank and be a different style, but they all want to have, they all want to be presentable, appropriate for the venue. Yeah, yeah. They want to look good and feel good. So that's kind of the common, you know, style of quality you're talking about. It's kind of where I've ended up in terms of my tone. Try jargon or the, you know, slang I use is right. really more. Right. Would that be more on a on a web on the page for the other you know the funky stuff? You would have that jargon there and the professional stuff on the professional side. On the buying page of suits, I'm going to have a variety of suits. I don't have the funky suit page and the conservative suit page. I've got suits, and so they're all right. They're all on there, but you should have something that would say funky style or something. Well, it, it, it's really something I don't need to say that because I just show it. Yeah, well, the I images the images can speak for themselves. Of variety of sizes, a variety of styles, um, people do alterations. No matter mm -hmm. what your mm -hmm. choice is um, and what your occasion is, you know, we can dress you and your party up for a wedding. You know, those kind of so in that case, I, I think that the tone would really be one of confidence, one of we got this. You know, um, I it makes me think of a um, a salesperson at a department store who is fitting you for a suit, right? They're going to be somewhat formal um, because you're paying a significant amount of money for this suit, um, but they're, they're also going to be sort of a, a confidant where you can tell them, okay, here's the situation. Here's how I need to look. Here's how I want to feel in the suit. And they say, I know exactly what you need. And I have it in stock. You're almost like a consultant because yes. we're an expert at this. And just tell us what the occasion and what kind of feelings yes. we want. And then yes. we can help help guide you. Yeah, yeah. In regards to tone, in that example, <coughs> how would you distinguish yourself from like men's warehouse, for example? Because <laughs> you, you also need some distinction. Yeah, so you need to figure out where you fit into the marketplace. Are you a Joseph A. Bank or are you an outlet store? Mm -hmm. That's going to help you determine the tone too. Uh -huh. So price point comes into play um, and your overall positioning in the marketplace. Yeah, well, and the also more niche markets too. Certain absolutely, markets absolutely. You're not having to compete with those guys. So the more that you can um, create a, a brand personality, mm -hmm. the stronger the voice is going to come through in your writing. You almost like you can think of it as a situation where you're writing for another brand. When you write for that brand, you put on a uniform, and it gets you in the the right mindset. You know, you you're acting it out. Um, it may not be how you write in your own business, but for them, you have a vision of who the person is that's speaking. You know, it really does help to envision it as a person. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of, so what, what I do with my clients a lot is I, um, I'll work with a lot of solopreneurs and I'll think, well, how would they say it, right? I'll hear, I'll like actually hear them in my head saying it. And if I've written something and I try to imagine them saying it and it sounds a little awkward, I know it's not right. So that can help keep you on track as well. It's a little harder for a big brand, but yeah. you can come up with that persona in your mind. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, pause, point of view. So uh, point of view, as we learned in school, can be first person, second person, third person, and then there's some variations within the third person. When you're writing copy, most of the time, you wanna stick to second person. It's that magical word, Y-O-U, that we all love to hear. When you say you, it really pulls the reader into what it is you're saying. Um, when you use first person point of view, 
I language or we language, it's a little more narrative. It's more as though you're telling a story, but you're almost taking the reader out of it, right? Third person point of view, if you're gonna talk about yourself in the third person, it's a little odd, um, but it comes across as more removed, colder. Um, it's, you're not really forming as much of a connection with your reader. So in most cases for copywriting, third person point of view is not recommended. Um, I try to stick to second person point of view personally because I like to make it all about my audience, all about that potential customer. Um, but in some cases, you do need to use the I or the we to talk about who you are to that person. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, okay. All right, so word choice. Um, even if you decide that you're gonna do a mix of second person and first person point of view in your copy, you still need to make a decision on whether you're gonna say I or we. Um, this comes into play a lot with freelancers and solo printers. Um, we tend to use we instead of I because it makes us seem bigger. Like our businesses are more established. We have more experience. We're a we, we're a team, right? And I've seen this so often with people who actually work alone. Um, they use that as sort of a cover up, uh, something to make them feel more confident. But what they're sacrificing is that personal relationship with their audience. When you're uh, willing to say I and to take ownership of that, your audience gets to know you. They get to know how you personally feel about something, the way that you personally operate. You're not hiding behind this elusive, mysterious we, um, which is especially mysterious if you go to your about page and it's just you on there, right? Then people are wanting, okay, well, so who's the rest of the people on your team? And you keep saying we. Um, so I, I really try to encourage my freelancer clients and solopreneurs to use more I language because it is a lot more powerful. And of course, if you have a team, then use we. You know, It's authentic in that case. Um, but if there's a, an opportunity for you to work in the eyes, I think you should. So I'll give you an example. Um, I have a client who has a big moving company and uh, most of the language is we language when we're writing her copy. But we have a page that's specifically about her we can work in a quote from her where she's either telling a story about why she got into the business or she's talking about how important this business is to her, it just makes the copy that much stronger. Um, so the other thing with word choice, aside from point of view, let me catch up here, contractions and jargon. Okay, so um, I have a client who offers a white glove service, and uh, in some of her copy, she used the word customers, and in some of the copy, she used clients. Well, being a white glove service, it's being positioned towards more affluent uh, clients. I encourage her to only use the word clients. Create that distinction there, right? Um, customers feels a little more like small business, clients feels a little more elevated. So even subtle choices like that can change the way that your writing sounds, and it can also um, help your reader self-identify if the writing or the service is for them. Contractions are very similar. When you use contractions, don't, won't, can't, it's less formal, uh, it's a little more conversational, but if you're trying to establish a brand that's a little more elevated, you probably don't wanna use contractions. Okay, so word banks. This is my super complex magical tool. Um, it's a piece of paper. It's really all it is. And it's a piece of paper that contains uh, phrases, um, the tone and the point of view that you want to use in your copy. And it sounds kind of stupid simple, but I'm telling you it really works. So in your word bank, um, you do identify the tone and the point of view, but you can also uh, include specific words and phrases that you want to make sure that you work into your copy consistently. It's something that's going to help people recognize that the copy is actually coming from you. I have a client who um, is a brand coach and her brand, uh, her company is called Launching Your Success. The theme of her brand is space. And so in all of her emails, 
um, whether they're transactional emails, welcoming, welcoming you to her newsletter, or acknowledging that she received your contact form, we use uh, some branded sign-offs. Um, I'm going to give you some examples. Ready for launch? Robin. All systems go? Robin. Blast off? Robin. Shoot for the stars. So you get the point, right? Each one is a little bit different. They're coming from the same person, from the same brand. And if you were to remove her logo and her name, you would still be able to recognize that that email came from her. It also makes it a little more fun for the person who's reading your message, um, because then they start to wonder, well, I wonder what the next email is. Um, of course, you can still have some variation in there. For example, uh, we sent out an email with uh, music resources for podcasters, and that one we signed off with Rock On, because you know, it's music. Um, and music is also a big part of her brand. Um, on your board mix, I, I like your concept. Yeah. And maybe you're going to get into this later. I, my brain goes to search engine optimization, SEO, mm -hmm. because on that word bank, I'd want to be able to say, okay, we have spooks, we have fashions, we have styles, words that will help me from the search engine optimization standpoint, mm -hmm. and also in, in an appropriate way, get woven into the page, mm -hmm. and an appropriate way Google will find that and match it up to search it. So I would kind of lay in, layer in SEO as, as a component of that. I love that you brought that up, yes. <laughs> Um, so we could have a whole other conversation about oh. SEO. <laughs> but um, when it comes <coughs> to the word banks for your brand, I would say leave those words out, actually. Um, what you would want to include instead is the adjectives that you use to describe your suits or the way that you describe your service or your price point. Um, I would keep it focused more on the adjectives, the descriptive words, than on the SEO. Those keywords. Those keywords you're gonna, you're working in anyway. That's sort of the mechanics of your copy. Um, the voice of your copy is more of the style. Does that make sense? Yeah. SEO is a, a whole nother conversation, though. Yeah. <laughs> All right. The, in the conversation today is different than the conversation yesterday. Yeah. The conversation tomorrow. Oh, it's yeah. It's always changing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, it's actually nice. Sometimes I have clients who get into the groove of this whole brand voice thing in their copywriting, and they get excited, they get a little overzealous, and they start getting really clever. Never want for cleverness. It may seem really clear to you what you mean when you say something, but it's not always clear to your audience. So um, especially when it comes to your navigation menu and those H1 headers, which are super important for SEO, be super clear. Don't try to get overly clever there. Where you want to get clever is in your descriptions, in the paragraph copy on your page. You can even do it in the, the H2s and the h 3 some of those subheadings, right? Um, but never sacrifice clarity for Architecture is um, basically the organization, the structure of the content on your website. It's not visible to the people who visit your site, but it affects the experience that they have. So good information architecture is seamless. It provides your visitors with a pleasant experience. They don't even think about how your content is organized. On the other hand, bad information architecture will leave your website visitors feeling totally frustrated because they're looking for this one piece of information and they thought it would be here and it's not there and now they can't find it and this doesn't make any sense. Does everyone understand information architecture? Yeah? Semantic HTML comes into play with uh, information architecture. Semantic HTML is basically HTML markup that wraps your content on the back end, tells computers how to read that content, how to make sense of it. So um, it's part of your information architecture, but again, it's not visible to the user. Can you tell me uh, which one of these is um, semantic HTML or also semantic markup? It's also called. Markup. Yeah, 
Yeah, I thought I had a trick question here. It is all of them, it is all of them. It even includes things like block quote, right? So um, sometimes people are tempted to use different heading styles based on the way that they look to the person reading the page. Um, please don't do that, because <laughs> these things are used by bots who are crawling your page for SEO. It helps them make sense of the content. Um, they're also used for screen readers, so it helps with the accessibility of the content on your page. Um, when you're using the heading styles H1, H2, H3, etc., you can always change the way that they look once you've applied that heading style. Um, I think most of you guys probably know this, right? Kind of looking around. Pretty computer savvy, okay. Um, and I think the editor has this really nifty tool that we can now use to check the semantic HTML of the content that we've written. Um, so when you're editing a post or a page, you can click on the I, lowercase i icon. It'll give you a little bit of metadata about your post or your page, but it also gives you this really clear outline of what your content is about. So you can easily see from that outline if you've mistakenly labeled an H3 as an H1 or vice versa. Is it the schema? Um, no, it's similar, but schema is um, it's another markup language that identifies um, what your content is about and what your website is about. It's just a little bit different than um, heading styles and you know and identifying something as a paragraph versus a, an H2. So schema might say, my website is um, about education, right? Or it might say, my web, my, this particular web page is an event page, and here's some more information about the event that's written in the schema markup so that a computer or a bot can read it. Um, but it's, it's a little bit different. Any other questions? No? Okay. Okay. Um, so I very quickly ran through a lot of things. Um, we talked about brands, not brands. Uh, we also talked about your ideal audience. Um, that could also be a whole other talk, um, how to find your ideal audience, especially when you feel like you're serving lots of different audiences. Um, We've talked about some literary devices that can help you lock in the brand voice in your copywriting, tone, point of view, and word choice. And you also got that awesome resource <laughs> that you can all use. Uh, it doesn't cost anything, a word bank. Um, and just remember that you want to try to keep that to descriptive language rather than those SEO keywords. So, so how, so I'll throw it back to you. So yeah. what do you do to accommodate SEO? You, you've had your brand, you've got it, it's is that going to happen naturally? I mean, most of us kind of have to. Word density isn't maybe a big deal anymore, but there are definitely certain words that that I may or may not naturally put in, but that I need to accommodate in my copy. How do you deal with the SEO kind of the requirements of a, making sure your site's SEO friendly when you're doing good, appropriate brand? Yeah, um, well, so it's interesting you said it, you have to incorporate words that you might not naturally incorporate, right? SEO is changing every day. Google is always updating their algorithm. And what Google will tell you is that you should write in a natural way, that you shouldn't try to optimize your text for SEO. That's the opposite of what they want. They want you to just write clear sentences, they want you to use a semantic markup, and they want to make sure that you're providing information that's actually valuable to your audience. Um, there's still a lot of people who play the SEO game and try to kind of gamify it, but it's really not what Google recommends. Um, and they're moving farther and farther away from that. You know, every update seems to eliminate some trick that we all figured out, right? Uh, SEO is really a whole other conversation, but no, when I you're when you're um, I will say that it's worthwhile to do keyword research and figure out what words your competitors are using to describe products and services, but also to find out how your customer words something. So um, I'll give you an example. White glove moving, right? Um, I often search for white glove moving as a phrase or luxury moving. Google Trends 
Um, have you used that before? It's a great little tool. It doesn't give you an absolute value for the search volume. It gives you a relative value. So you're able to search these two different comparable phrases and see which one is more often used and even where it's more often used in the country. It's a very cool tool, yeah. Um, so definitely do keyword research and make sure that you're, you're using the right language, meaning the language that your customers are using to try to find your products and services. Um, but I can't recommend trying to force keywords in. I'm glad you said that because it, yeah. I mean, I've been doing it for a long time, but there was the day where you have Yes, all, you know, absolutely. Jam, you know, get that word density and all this stuff. My hope is SEO companies go out of business because they can't, there's really nothing they can do special anymore. Uh, so I'm off with it. You know, I can't keep up with SEO to change things. Yeah, yeah. I think there is going to be probably more of a shift to the pay per click stuff, which is still really based on those keywords. Um, but do some keyword research. Find out what your customers are using. That's, that's the best advice I can give you. Yoast is also a great resource. Yoast is the most popular SEO plugin for WordPress. Um, and they have great content on their blog. They talk a lot about holistic SEO, which is that idea that you don't want to try to force anything. You want to just, even with word count, right? There's everyone saying, oh, you have to write 2,000 words now on your page. You don't actually have to write 2,000 words. Um, the more that you write, the more you're going to talk about what it is you're, you're writing about. But the length of your post or your page should be determined by um, how many words you need to convey what it is you're trying to convey. Are you a believer in metadata? Yeah, sure. So does your metadata reflect your brand? You're going to talk about, you know, if you're going to have a, a description, descriptive phrase as your metadata for your page when it mm -hmm. comes up in some search, mm -hmm. that also should reflect your brand. Well. Absolutely. So um, meta descriptions are a perfect example. Um, it's a big part of SEO. Your meta description is going to show up on a search results page, but it's also going to show up um, when someone shares a page or a post on social media. You know, so whatever platform, Twitter, Instagram, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, is going to pull the uh, featured image for that page or post, and it's going to pull the title and then the meta description. So. It's, it's an ambassador, right, for your website when it's posted on someone else's profile or page. Um, it's definitely a part of your brand voice and your brand overall. Great questions. Um, you were a little early. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, are there any other questions? Metadata, yeah. But then all that stuff changes in Facebook because I heard somewhere that if you post too much on Facebook, now they're going to start limiting you. Oh, I mean, all that stuff is changing, and all those stupid ads now in an ad. You're watching something, and mm -hmm. an ad pops in. That's so annoying. Yeah. And well, then, if you feel that way, you should look up the indie web um, and do some research there. Have you heard of that? Yes, I have. Yeah. So. What's it called? Indie web is um, it's a term for independent web. It's sort of like. Oh, right. I mean, it's very WordPress. Um, it's similar to WordPress in spirit because it's all about democratizing the web, making things more accessible, tearing down walled gardens. Facebook is an example of a walled garden where in order to post on the platform, you have to have a profile, you have to be a part of it, you have to kind of buy into it. Um, but there are alternative social media platforms like Mastodon um, is an example of one that is, um, it's federated. <laughs> this is really, you guys keep sending me off on tangents, really. Um, that is a, definitely a whole other talk. And I know someone who's much better at giving that talk. We both do. <laughs> but I'm, I'm really glad you guys are asking questions. You've been so sweet to me. I am not a good presenter. I set out a goal this year to be better at public speaking. So I appreciate you guys just being my guinea pigs for this talk. It's the first time I've given this talk. Um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So I just wanted to go over a couple more things. I, I do want to leave some time for everybody to chit chat. That'll be awesome because that's partially why we're here. We want to have everybody to network, get to know each other, uh, kind of get you know, get everybody into the into the mix. Uh, I just wanted to bring up Slack. This is our um, communications channel for all things WordPress, West Orlando WordPress. Um, we have a number of channels. We have a developers channel, a general channel. 
Uh, we have a meetup channel, random, a volunteers channel. That's the one I want to see filled up. If we can, because we have a lot of work we need to do. This we're coming up on one year. November is our one year anniversary. Yay! So, yep. So coming up on one year, we want to start filling up these uh, volunteer. I'll go over that in just a minute. Uh, we have uh, something about a website there. Uh, Alan's been helping us with the design of our website, so he's uh, he's doing really great with that. Um, but we're going to need to fill it with content. We're going to want some bloggers. Maybe some videos to go up if you guys have things you want to put up there. We want to, we want to make this something that can help you guys promote yourselves a bit too. Um, so we've got all these. If, if, uh, who, who has used Slack before? Anybody? Okay, so we've got about half the room. So Slack is just kind of like a chat channel. So you just go to slack.com and download it. Um, and I'll show you the link to where you sign up for our particular Slack. And you can, I've got a, I've got a whole bunch of channels down the side here of my own, but uh, this is us. Right, yeah, here. We're gonna need to, we're gonna get a logo on there so it's a little more recognizable. All right, so jumping over to the rest of the presentation for tonight. <coughs> so for those of you who are new to our meetup, this is uh, what we're trying to do. Um, so our upcoming meetups, we have first Fridays is our collaborative meetup and that's where we all meet at Axum Coffee um, in Winter Garden, and the next one is November 1st from 8.30 to 10 a.m. So we just get together, we usually sit out on the patio, now that we're getting more people, that we just kind of line up some tables out in the back there, and we just, you know, if you got a problem with your website, we'll all just kind of get together, two or three of us, helping uh, another person, and just whatever expertise you can bring to the table, uh, come join us. If you have questions, come join us, you know, we'll, we'll do the best we can to get, ev get to everybody's uh, questions and problems. Um, and then this is the third Thursday meeting, so we try to make it simple to remember, first Fridays, third Thursdays. Um, that's right, yep, November 21st from at 6 o'clock. Um, tonight the um, 33 and Melt was closed, uh, apparently somebody in their family has passed away, so they're doing a funeral thing for this week, so sad to hear that. Um, but they should be open the next time we meet, so, yep, so the week before Thanksgiving, that's our next uh, third Thursday. Um, we are trying to do a holiday party, but the sponsor we thought we had fell through. <laughs> so if you happen to know of any company, like software or otherwise, who might have an interest in trying to you know, sponsor us and, and get us as an audience, uh, please let us know. Um, we're on the, on the Meetup channel and stuff like that. So. Or if you have friends that have a restaurant or bar that yeah. you like to host us to, you yep. know, offer happy hour drinks and appetizers and stuff. Totally, yeah, helpful. absolutely. Also, if you'd like to present, we would love to have you come up. Uh, Kara did an awesome job tonight. Another round of applause for her. Last time we had Arena Blumenfeld. She's also from the Orlando meetup, and we're just poaching their speakers as much as we can. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> A huge technology, you know, community here in, in Orlando area. So, you know, we're gonna we're gonna try to get some of those premier speakers coming. But if you have something you'd like to present. We would love to have you. Yeah, Just so you uh, reach out to both Rod and myself. Yep, if absolutely. Hope. <laughs> hope early, everybody. <laughs> She's awesome. <laughs> All right, so WordCamp 2019. Uh, that's WordCamp US is uh, St. Louis, Missouri, <coughs> November 1st through the 3rd. Um, if you're really into WordPress, these are great to go to. If you're not into WordPress, they're still great to go to because uh, you will learn a ton, a ton. Um, and then there's one in Miami on. Yeah. They did live streaming online for free mm -hmm. too. I don't know. I, last time I checked, it wasn't up yet. But, yeah. Um, take a look at that so that way you can still go to the sessions without having to go to St. Louis. In yes. November. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And then there's one in Miami on February 28th, March through March 1st. Um, and then when the next uh, 2021 for Orlando is announced, we'll get that push, pushed up here too. So we have a number of resources. We have a Facebook page, uh, West Orlando WP. And coming soon, we'll have our website. We've already got hosting and everything. We just got to finish building it. Um, we have uh, the West Orlando WordPress Meetup. We have a Slack. Join at WALP Slack. <laughs> Bit.ly uh, slash WALP Slack. Um, and then we have uh, our lynda.com for all uh, Orange County Library System patrons and Lake County, I believe. Seminole. But n Oh, no, Seminole, but not Seminole, Lake. Not Lake. Not lake. Yep, so you can, you can access every WordPress, everything on there. It's tons of good stuff there. WP Beginner is also great. 
Um, and if you're looking for a WordPress job, I created a quick link to indeed.com for you there. So let's see. Um, so here are, so basically we are organized by WordPress. We were able to get into their network, so they advertise us on everybody's WordPress dashboards, which is, how many of you found out through the WordPress dashboard? Good, excellent, so it's working, yay. Uh, otherwise we would have to buy Facebook ads and try to get people to come and it's a lot harder that way. <laughs> Um, so we have, uh, they pay for our, our venue, thank you. Um, they, uh, they audit our activity through the RSVP, so the more people we get, the more sponsor you know, cred we get. So great, thank you for coming. Um, so uh, with the pro, you know, we're able to show up in people's dashboards and also on Google through um, semantic search, which is great. Um, so we wanna grow the group, so tell your friends and please volunteer, <laughs> please. <laughs> Um, so here are the volunteer positions we have available. We need at least two more co-organizers to kind of help uh, find speakers and all that kind of stuff uh, and just kind of keep things flowing and rolling. Uh, Hope and I are doing okay, but you know, it'd be great to have some more help. Uh, assistant organizer, event organizer, content guru, and, and video producer. So this is what the co-organizer does. It's about one to five hours per month, depending. We've, we've kind of streamlined it so it's like an hour or two. So um, we also have uh, an assistant organizer role uh, to kind of increase our membership, find sponsors, send out reminders, kind of be a booster for everybody. Um, and then the event organizer, this is a person we need to help us find new speakers. We're, we're trying to keep the calendar filled and Hope's doing a great job of that, but we'd like to give that to somebody to be, you know, just bird dogging as many people as we can find to, to speak. Um, content guru, somebody who likes to write. I wonder, I wonder if we have somebody here who would like to <laughs> to write. <laughs> She's like, what? <laughs> Great, awesome. I didn't mean to put pressure on you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I did, right? <laughs> so yeah, just somebody who likes to, to be our content person and, and help us, you know, fill our website and our blog with, with posts about WordPress. Um, and we, we'd, be, we'd be happy to feature other people's blogs, link over to you, give you some link juice, that kind of stuff too. Republish some of your posts, indicating that kind of thing. Um, and then somebody who can do the the mess that I have over there. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, most of the time it works. Now I think I've got it figured out, but sometimes we, we don't do too well. But uh, yeah, so somebody to do video, edit it, post it online for us, that kind of stuff. So if you know anybody, bring them along. Um, so here's all of that, again, for, for reference. All right, so everybody mingle, have fun. Thank you. <laughs>